Our episode begins on the Temple Island on the planet of Octu. Anakin Skywalker marched up the endless stairs leading to the top of the island where the Jedi Council had gathered. Anakin's presence came with a heavy burden. He came here to start a gripe with Master Windu. He was going to face down the newly crowned Grand Master and have a discussion with him. More so, Anakin was going to get into an argument with Windu because he believed he should be on the front lines, taking the fight back to the Sith rather than just sitting here dormant on a planet doing nothing he was prepared yet to do. Anakin walked up the stairs, past the caretakers, and towards the topmost part of the island. Anakin found the Jedi Council. There were a couple new members of the Council that had just been added since the fall of Coruscant, though Anakin wasn't all too concerned with who they were. Anakin raised his voice and called out Mace Windu by his name. As the Grand Master turned ever so slightly towards Skywalker, Mace knew what this was about and he could tell by Anakin's ignorant attitude what kind of discussion this would be. Skywalker demanded to know why he was being forced to stay here in Ahch 2 instead of taking back the Republic with the rest of the Jedi. Windu looked over at the other Masters and excused himself as he stepped forward and looked at Skywalker. Before Windu could say a word, Anakin went off on a tangent. He started by saying that even Windu had to know that Anakin couldn't just teach these Jedi younglings, some, many of which who had already had lost their master. Windu sighed as Anakin continued blasting away, talking about the responsibility he had to take on because Windu thought it would be a better idea to keep the Chosen One here on Octu instead of with the clones. Windu stepped forward and without raising his tone, he told Skywalker that it was for this exact reason. It was because he wasn't yet able to come to terms with the predicament of the situation, because Anakin hadn't yet figured out that revenge wouldn't bring Kenobi back, just like it wouldn't bring back the Senators of the Republic lost on Coruscant. And while Anakin had lost his mother not long before, it would be the same case for her. It wouldn't bring her back. His revenge and lust for it wouldn't make her return from the dead. She was gone, and that was a fact that Anakin had to come to terms with. Skywalker growled as he turned away and told Windu that he was being treated badly because Windu never liked him. Windu again, without raising his voice, spoke down to Skywalker, reminding him of his place. He may have been the chosen one, but there was no reason for any of the Jedi to trust him. While sure, there was a paradox of having faith in Skywalker, which Windu had, he didn't trust Anakin at all. He told Skywalker that while Kenobi and Yoda may have agreed that he may have been the chosen one, the chosen one wouldn't act like a repugnant child who had just received their first discipline. Windu continued telling Skywalker that he could keep him here on Ahch 2 for the rest of the war if he wanted to, because this was much, much larger than simply insisting that because he was the chosen one, all would be right with the galaxy. Windu took one more step forward as he sized up Skywalker by standing up next to him and asserting his dominance. Skywalker reciprocated it, not sure whether to stand tall or back down. Windu noticed this as he continued and told Skywalker that there was much more at play. This wasn't about him or getting back at the Sith, this was about survival. And for Mace Windu, he had an entire Jedi Order to worry about, lest worry about an undisciplined spoiled little brat. Skywalker bit his lip and crunched his face, trying not to say anything, as a hand floated down towards his waist. Windu noticed this, and he didn't like it. He asked Skywalker if he'd really throw everything away, because he hadn't yet learned his place. Anakin looked into Windu's eyes as he turned his head away. Mace told Skywalker to return to the Garden Island and stay there until an appropriate punishment was levied against him for trying to raise his lightsaber against the Grand Master. Anakin took a deep breath, to which Windu asked if there was anything else he'd like to get off his chest. Skywalker shook his head and walked down the face of the island. Was Windu right? Most definitely. Did he handle it correctly? Not in the slightest. But Anakin was acting out of place. He was acting like the golden child when everyone had to be taken care of. He couldn't just be put wherever and whenever he wanted because he said so. He had a responsibility. Though in all fairness to Windu, showing up Skywalker like that put his ego in check, which is exactly what Anakin needed in a moment like this. Anakin eventually made his way back down to a speeder and shot back across the ocean over to the Garden Island so that he could think about what had just happened. The benefit of the Garden Island is that it would provide some level of comfort to him, to zero in on his feelings and on his thoughts, all of what mattered to him at this moment and how he would handle all of it effectively. When he turned, he ducked and made his way around the edge of the island to find himself some privacy, to which he would sulk while looking over the ocean and the massive waves it produced. His thoughts reflected onto all of what he'd lost. In the span of a week, he lost his mother, his master who he considered his father, and the love of his life. 
his mentor in Palpatine, and the entire place he called home. For a normal Jedi caught off from their emotions, it was rather easy to walk a fine line past all that trauma, but for someone like Anakin who wasn't cut off from his emotions, it was especially difficult. He sat on the edge of a mountain for hours. During this time, Mace had a conversation with the Jedi Council members. Firstly, a couple of them, while seeing Mace's point, wanted to ask about his decision to talk to Skywalker as he did. Mace reminded them how troublesome Skywalker could become if he wasn't kept on a tight leash, and so he made sure to make a point to show Anakin who was in charge, and that this operation at hand was much more important than the desire and wants for revenge for one of them. Skywalker was acting out of place, and he was treated accordingly for doing so. Regardless of which, Mace had a lot more important things on his plate. He informed Jocasta Nu that Skywalker was not to leave the Garden Island. She could do what she wanted from there, but he was being grounded as per request of the Jedi Council. Master Jocasta understood, and so she made a personal note to ensure that Skywalker didn't go out of line anywhere. Though there was only one issue, Anakin was missing. He couldn't be found anywhere, and that was an immediate issue for Master Jocasta. Because it's not like the Jedi wanted Anakin to run away, they just wanted him on the Garden Island until he was ready and mature enough to lead men into combat. There were lives at stake here, and they couldn't just throw a bunch of clones under Anakin Skywalker and expect him to take care of them like they were his own men, like they were his brothers in combat. Show the wisdom of the Council, in this particular circumstance, underestimated Anakin's ability to lead, but they were judging his ability to lead off of his most recent encounter with him, which didn't leave them with the most positive feeling about how he would lead clones. Regardless, Jocasta Nu sent out Matabre and a couple other Jedi Padawans and Knights to try and find Skywalker in the Garden Island. Barriss Afi was one of the other Padawans, being that she was just a year younger than Skywalker. Though Jocasta Nu wanted to be kept on the down low, she didn't want other Jedis to see wavering from the Chosen One. On the Temple Island, Mace Windu and the rest of the Jedi Council were having a meeting with the survivors of the Battle of Coruscant, as well as top clone strategists and commanders. It was the best of the best, especially of what remained. The Republic had very little thin supply lines to Kamino, and they didn't have the vessels to keep the line defended. It was a singular line of planets that arced around Separatist lines, but it didn't escape the bubble from which the Separatists had locked down. From Kamino, there was Bothawai to Faulin, leading to Rhodia, Zar, and then the Sullus Vaughn. Octu was located in an unknown region of space inside of the Outer Rim, and so it was safe, but this thin line across the Republic defenses was really weak. It wouldn't take much for the Separatists to attack it and break it. Though with the limited communication the Republic was getting from Bis, Corellia, and Kuat, there seemed to be a chance that if they could connect to one of those three planets, the Republic would have a new fighting force. It was just a matter of getting them here or getting over there. Mace Windu discussed the best possible trajectory for finding victory on the battlefront, especially being that they had to utilize the Separatists as allies for the time being. It was the same realization that Admiral Trench came to. Of course, the only difference being that if the Separatists were attacked by the Republic, Admiral Trench would have no issue curb stomping the Republic into submission. He wasn't going to do that just because it could cost him valuable resources in a war of which he needed all of his resources for. The Republic also knew the importance of this unsigned treaty. Though the Separatist government stationed on Raxus was coming to learn about how unfavorable their predicament had become. Of course, the Separatists had strong enough holds across the Mid-Rim and Outer Rim, such as Raxus, Sereno, and Hypori. They just didn't know when the best time was to take advantage of their resources. The Republic then committed to a strategy of combat that would take advantage of neutral sites, planets with little to no population to land their armies on and then proceed from there with building listened outposts and simply forward command stations. Nothing too serious would go into these projects, but it would be a healthy way for the Jedi and the clones to get used to working alongside each other. And so it would also allow for the Republic to listen in on the Separatists and the Sith Empire. And so it was decided. The Jedi would start pairing up with different groups of clones to go out to the galaxy to settle on territory that hadn't yet been touched by the Sith or the Separatists. The mission statement was rather simple, and it was understood by the vast majority of troops involved in this process. While at the same time, Lama Su reported that the Kaminoans would begin rebuilding their cloning facilities on Borovio, and from there they could begin a new leg of the Clone Trooper program to ensure that the Galactic Republic had suitable forces for the war. The best part about Borovio is that it wasn't too far to sight from the Republic lines, so it would leave a fairly protected line, especially since it wasn't really on anyone's radar, and plus, the stations at Borovio were basically already constructed. A couple local systems in the area knew about the planet, but it wouldn't picture as a Republic stronghold. It would also be much safer for clones 
that had their growth acceleration at 10 times the normal rate of a human being. The clones grown on Borovia would be ready for combat within two years of training, and they wouldn't be outfitted with inhibitor chips because of the biology behind it. Across the galaxy at the center of everything, the Sith who had done a fine job at establishing their lines of victory slowed down. It wasn't their fault. They ran face first into a wall after marching across all the northern half of the galaxy. The Sith were a bit at a discombobulation, because without victory they had a deal with each other, which was always a cynical mistake for the Sith. They couldn't be around each other, and bickering always began immediately. The bickering wasn't always over something rather rudimentary, though there was one Sith from within the ranks who believed he could do more than the combined efforts of the Sith Empire, though the tragedy for this Sith in particular was his distinct inability to have a student of his own. It didn't matter. He was a powerful Sith Lord, and while he wasn't betraying the trust of the Sith from within his inner circle, he wouldn't stand around and simply be patient anymore. He couldn't do it. It wasn't the way of the Sith, and it was weak. Darth Sion knew better than to simply challenge every Sith Lord for authority, so instead of authority, he stormed off, renouncing this order of Sith and informing them that he would do much better without them. The Sith didn't really care, actually. The reason Sion's decision came so fast was because he was pushed aside by Malgus. The Triumvirate was in the middle of taking over Molinist when Malgus swooped in and finished off the job for them. Not long after that, when the Sith returned to conquer their former home world of Ren Var, the three children of Vitiate came in and finished the job for the Triumvirate, which wasn't much, other than getting to the temple before they did. Nihilus couldn't care less. He knew the weight he carried, and Darth Treya didn't care either, but Sion on the other hand couldn't stand the fact that this was happening. He felt like the Sith didn't respect them, and he went ballistic. Treya told him to knock it off, to which he obeyed until this meeting with the other Sith Lords, where he felt insignificant to all of them. When Sion stormed off, he took a small detachment with them, around 1200 men, and a starship to go into deep space. Sion remembered a Jedi home world. Of course, Coruscant was always a notable one, but he had one in mind of which he would like to go to. For Sion, it would be just, it would be right, and the Sith would have the revenge against the Jedi. All he cared about was slaughtering the Jedi and victory. That was the true issue for Sion. He was all too focused on the minor details, whereas the successful Sith of their time realized the importance of grandeur, which is why Revan, Malgus, and Vitiate each found success in their own times. In the same regard, it's why Darth Bane was actually respected at the table of Sith, because he didn't show such weaknesses. Lord Treya wasn't too concerned. She realized that this would either be the last time she saw her student, or his greatest lesson. Regardless of which, she still had Nihilus, who was always as loyal as could be when it came to serving her. Of course, on another note, she did have Revan and his little student in Malak, but she didn't care much for Malak and allowed Revan to be good at what he was good at. In Treya's mind, the strong would prevail in the ranks of the Sith and assert themselves in the roles they believed they should play, while the weak would always fill the role they were meant to fill, being servants to those with power. Though, in which respect, she never saw Nihilus as incapable or weak. Rather, he wasn't a leader of his own. He did as he pleased, and he respected the wishes of his master, subservient in his own twisted way. On Octu, Anakin Skywalker walked around the Garden Island. He was fighting with himself. He couldn't escape his demons. He avoided running into any Jedi, and by the time the night came around, he found solitude. He finally was alone, and yet the only thoughts dawning in his mind were those of running. He couldn't escape the memories of Obi-Wan Padme or his mother dying. They all sat in his mind, because Anakin put the responsibility on himself for not being able to save them. Anakin could have saved Obi-Wan had he been wiser and paid more attention to his surroundings in the battle of the Jedi Temple. He could have done anything more to save them. He should have been on Tatooine when the Tuscans came for his mother, so that he could defend her. He should have been inside the Senate building, rushing Padme out before it was bombarded, but he wasn't. He held himself accountable for the mistakes of which weren't his fault. Anakin couldn't get over it though. He couldn't escape that his failures led to the deaths of those he loved. The crashing of the waves in the dark night only continued to barrage him with the feelings of disappointment with himself. Anakin couldn't help but feel the draw to the darkness. It had always been there, but now it was at the forefront of his mind. Anakin continued walking around the island silently. He looked across the oceans. He could feel the pull of the darkness. It lashed onto his heart and drew on him as if it was begging for him to come closer, to try it, to envelop himself inside the dark side of the Force. Anakin couldn't resist the temptation. It was as if he were to fall into the dark side and would become free at last. But the truth is, he'd become a slave to the dark side, 
Anakin found a speeder, and, while doing his best to avoid the guards, he took the speeder across the waters of Octu. As the wind and the waves crashed by, he headed down below the Temple Island. The night was chilly already, but when Anakin entered the cave below, he felt colder. The planet of Octu had a balance in the Force. There was just a powerful light and a powerful darkness. It was a matter of facing those. He stepped forward, his boots crunching down on seashells and moist rocks of the cave as he felt the force flow around him. He felt a tornado of ruins. Anakin's mind was thrown into disarray as the room began spinning, and the sound of voices passed in and out of his ears. He heard Obi-Wan's final breath. He heard Shmi's voice. He heard the voice of Padme come out and tell him that she truly loved him. Anakin spun around as his eyes opened. He was staring in the darkness. Fog began to rise up around him as a heavy breathing could be heard. He heard the steps of heavy footsteps. Anakin looked around. And then a deep voice echoed off the walls, telling him it was a matter of time that he would see the path. A path far away from the Jedi. Anakin looked around on the ground around him, and then there were the bodies of the dead Jedi. Jocasta knew Plo Koon, Mace Windu, Natabre, and then littered next to them were the Padawans and younglings of the Jedi Order. Anakin looked up and saw a young Wookiee youngling growl, holding no lightsaber to defend itself. The voice laughed as it ignited a lightsaber, though the lightsaber of the Sith was held behind his back as it whipped around and swung through the Wookiee, cutting him to pieces. Anakin cried out as a voice told Skywalker that this is what he was called to do. This was where he deserved to be. Anakin felt his head. It was pulsating out of his body. He could feel the ground shake as Anakin demanded to know who it was. Before he could know, the fog vanished and the lightsaber did too. And then there was silence. Skywalker looked around the room without any visibility. And then he saw the mask of Nihilus rise before his eyes before disappearing. Moments later, he looked into the piercing eyes of Malgus, and then the heavy breathing that accompanied it. Skywalker was thrown from his feet as Darth Treya stood over him and said to him that the path from light to dark was easier than dark to light. Revan appeared next to her, telling Anakin that it would only be okay to join the darkness. It was power, all the power he ever wanted. Anakin screamed out and fell back. When he did, the little gem that Obi-Wan gave Skywalker flipped across his chest. It was a Silicix Oxalate that Kenobi gave Skywalker to give to the Duchess of Mandalore. Anakin looked at it. Before he could react, he heard Qui-Gon's voice. The voice asked Anakin if he believed he were the Chosen One. Anakin looked around before he looked over and saw a pristine palace. It reminded him of Theed on Naboo. He saw a young Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Jinn standing next to him. Skywalker looked closely as Obi-Wan's eyes turned around and looked at him. The word failure darted out of his mouth again and again. Anakin asked why. Obi-Wan fell flat into the ground. Skywalker tried to roll him over, but when he did, his body turned to dust. Anakin felt a hand on his shoulder. The voice was calming. It was feminine. It told Anakin to trust his intuition. It would not lead him astray. Skywalker turned, and all he saw was the back of a woman with flowing blonde hair. Anakin couldn't tell who it was, but before he could get a hold of this woman, he was thrown out onto the ground. Water fell from his mouth as he began coughing. His fist was balled up, and he opened his fist to see the gem that Kenobi gave him. Skywalker looked around and looked up. He heard footsteps. Skywalker looked for a rock to hide behind. He didn't want to start anything with anyone. He knew it was too risky to do that now. And the emotional drain from what he had just been through was a bit too much for him to deal with at this moment, and so he didn't want to confront anyone. He wanted to bypass them and escape. Skywalker looked out. He couldn't see much, but he could see lighter features. The robe being worn was a much lighter robe, and the figure was feminine. Anakin thought it was possibly Jocasta Nu, but when the face appeared from the shadows, it was much younger. The face was that of Anakin's favorite person in the galaxy at the moment, Natabre Morden. She had seemingly found her way to the Temple Island to find Skywalker and belittle him for being a fool. At least that's what Anakin thought. Anakin was in no part having that. He wasn't going to just deal with this again. Not that she was wrong, but he wasn't in a mood to deal with that amount of sass that she could easily distribute. Anakin heard his name called out by her. She looked everywhere. Anakin didn't peek out. He stayed hidden. Closing his eyes, Natare stepped forward speaking out, saying that she wasn't here to fight. She simply wanted to bring him back to the Garden Island. Anakin thought of the words to say. He looked over his shoulder and saw her getting closer. She stopped and closed her eyes. She then asked Anakin what he was so afraid of, asking why he was so afraid to be on the island with all those students. Anakin looked back towards the cave from which she had just come. Natabre told Anakin that they were both Jedi. They both had a duty to be here for each other, to be united as one. Anakin slowly got up as he leaned against the rock. He sat behind and looked over at her. Anakin's fear was noticeably written across his face. 
He looked down and he looked back up at her. He told her that he needed to go. She asked why he would betray the Jedi. Anakin shook his head, telling her that he wasn't, but not even he could believe that statement. Natabre told Anakin that she couldn't understand everything he had to say, but she would try. Anakin stepped forward telling her that he needed to go, that's what he needed to do in this moment, though Natabre was too stubborn to just let Anakin go off without explanation. She wanted proof that he wasn't just leaving the Jedi Order to join the Sith. Anakin looked away, and so Natabre dug deeper, asking why he came here to this cave. Skywalker looked at her and told her that she was awfully pushy. She looked at him and explained that she needed to do what was best for the Order. If being pushy was what was best for the Order, then it was for the best. Anakin looked at her and started walking forward, but she put her hands up and stopped him. She asked where he was going then. Anakin looked at her with a glare. She knew this look and asked if he was really going to start a fight with her rather than admit that he was too cowardous to talk about the emotions that he clearly had. Anakin's hand dropped to his belt as he grabbed his blade. Natabre didn't hesitate. She looked at his hand and then back to him, telling him to do it, to embrace the darkness by striking her down. It would make him no better than the Sith that killed his master and her master. Anakin gritted his teeth and stormed away. Natabre looked at him as he walked away. She asked if he was really going to forfeit everything. Anakin didn't respond as he made his way to the top side of the mountain, as he found himself a starfighter and left. Natabre on the other hand took a deep breath and fell to her knees. She sat alone in the cave. This was the first time she had a moment to take in everything. She had to be strong ever since she arrived at Octu. She never got a final word with her mentor. She never even got to say goodbye. She had to pretend that everything was going to be okay, so that the younglings didn't fear for their lives. And yet, here she was, facing down Anakin Skywalker. She knew that if he pulled his lightsaber, she would have died. There was no way in which she would be able to defend herself from him long enough. Maybe she could have, but the chances are, she would have lost her life. Anakin was, well, Anakin. She was a decent duelist, but she'd be remiss if she didn't admit how many times she almost died during the siege of the temple. Natabri looked at the ground, a tear slid from her cheek and flopped off her chin and landed on her robes. Her heart slowed down. It was at an accelerated pace as she faced down Anakin. She looked at the ground and her emotions rolled out. She knew she was a Jedi, and she knew she should be better than this, but it wasn't as easy as it sounded. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is part three of six. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Tiger Boy, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, Darth Cheesy, Apollo, Madman Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Flynn Van Cease, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Next episode, part two, is coming out next week, or otherwise known as episode four. Again, not everything is announced in every video. This one is a cliffhanger. It is Choices Part 1 and Part 2, so of course it's going to end with a cliffhanger. Um, I'm really excited for you guys to see Part 2. Um, kind of emotional. Getting emotional. Yeah. Alright. Hope you all enjoyed. I love you all. Spread the love. And always remember, my friends, may the Force be with you.